Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online uh, service here at All Saints Anglican Church in Amersfoort. In the service, we're going to pray. Uh, the acronym P-R-A-Y, we will take time to pause, to be still. Uh, we will rejoice, bring praise to God. Uh, we'll also reflect uh, on Scripture. When we come to intercessions, we will ask. And of course, through this service, we're seeking to say yes, to yield to God's will, what He's saying to us through this time of worship together. So as we come now to our service of prayer and worship, let's bow our heads and let's pause and be still. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's sing together. This morning we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves afresh to the service of God. We come now to our prayers of penitence where we refocus ourselves upon our God Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We keep some moments for personal reflection.
we pray together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song will we praise our God. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and redeemer of all. To you be glory and praise forever. From the waters of chaos you drew forth the world, and in your great love fashioned us in your image. Now through the deep waters of death you have brought your people to new birth by raising your Son to life and triumph. May Christ your light ever dawn in our hearts as we offer you our sacrifice of thanks and praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night is past, the day lies open before us, so let us now pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. And so we begin listening to God's word, and we begin with Psalm 73. As always, we're listening for a verse, a sentence the Lord may want to bring to our attention as we listen to the scriptures, believing that he is speaking and wants to speak to us through our worship today. So Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, I will tell of all your deeds. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We now listen to our Old Testament reading from Joshua, chapter 24, read by Thomas. The reading will be taken from Joshua chapter 24, beginning at the first verse. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. 
Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abram and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abram from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country to, of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their lands. When Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam, so he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Gargashites, Hivites, and Jebusites, but I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet again uh, ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities you did not build. And you live in them, and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our very eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we travelled. And the Lord drove them out before drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord, because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God, he is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, Throw away the foreign gods that are among you, and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God, and obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
We come to a New Testament reading from Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so we listen to our Benedictus now, our Gospel Canticle. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, Amen. And so we now come to our sermon. Shall we pray? Father, in this moment, uh, send your Holy Spirit afresh to teach us wherever we are at this point. As we dive into the Bible, would you awaken our hearts, expand our minds and shape our identities and lives today. We want to live increasingly a Jesus-shaped life. Amen. Whose disciple are you? Honestly. It's striking to think that you, me, everyone, is someone's disciple. We learned how to live from someone. We are someone's disciple. In fact, we are probably the disciple of some bodies. We are the disciples of our parents or other family members closely related to us. Often this has been good, but in some cases, tragically, it has not been a good experience. We are disciples of others, teachers our peers, our friends. We can even become the disciples of public figures, whether musicians, writers, or other celebrities. They communicate how life is, and we absorb their thinking or ideas or sayings. It is important to reflect whose disciples have we been, consciously or unconsciously, and to ask ourselves, what has been the results of that? Has that brought life into our lives? Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. The last words Matthew wants us to hear from Jesus as he finishes his Gospel. Jesus' assumption is that we will live our lives as his students, that we will be his disciples. We will obey everything he has commanded, and we would teach others to do the same. Disciples, making disciples, making disciples. 
as someone said. In these final words of Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, verses 13 to 27, he is basically saying, you have heard it, now just do it. Joshua in the Old Testament puts it another way, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Jesus now says, it is decision time. One of the biggest decisions uh, many of us face in our lives will be who we are going to marry. Perhaps you remember when you asked your spouse or they asked you to marry them. A decision which would shape the, which would affect the whole shape and course of the rest of your life. When I asked uh, Yolanda to marry me in November 2004, it was a week after I had planned to do it. That's a story in itself. In very short, we had been on a, a church uh, youth camp and we'd returned and that Sunday evening it was my plan to ask her to marry me. But after getting back, we had a call about a member of the church who's in need of help. Uh, so off we went. By the time we got back, uh, we were tired and it just didn't seem like the right time. So I decided to wait to the following weekend. Fortunately, I could ask her then. And even more fortunately, she said yes. Jesus is asking us to make an even more important decision. It's more important than who we will marry or what job we will do. The decision we will make will affect not only the rest of our lives. The gospel is about Christian discipleship. It will also affect our whole eternity. The gospel is about eternal life. We have two alternatives, Jesus says, to follow him or not to follow him. So firstly, the radical life. Two ways to live, Jesus says, a broad road, a narrow road. The Greek word for broad means spacious, roomy. So, no boundaries. Live as you like, without having to keep the standards Jesus has been setting out. So you can be proud, dishonest, manipulative, lustful, have sex with whoever you want. You can hate your enemies. You can keep all your money. You can criticize all you want. The other road, Jesus said, is narrow. In the original language it means restricted, confined, compressed. There are boundaries here. This is a Jesus-shaped life. A road of life where no unrighteous anger is allowed. No sex outside of marriage. No hatred. You give, pray fast without wanting people's approval. You put your security into seeking first the kingdom and not in wealth. It is a road where we are to, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. To live a life of forgiveness, non-retaliation, praying for your enemies, this is countercultural. To live in this way is the beautiful life. It's liberating, adventurous, attractive and radical. But it is not easy. We can be mocked for the way we live as Christians. And we know honestly, listening to Jesus' words, that to live this Jesus-shaped life is virtually impossible in our own strength. But the one who says these words, Jesus, he knows our human weakness, but he also knows our resources of the kingdom available to us. He knows the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. On this road, we do not go alone. He is with us by his Spirit to the end of the age. As the Liverpool Football Club anthem goes, you will never walk alone. Secondly, the, the long view. Jesus talks of two destinations. The broad road leads to destruction. The narrow road leads to life. Uh, years ago, there was a, a tragic accident on the Italian Riviera, uh, a young man was driving a sports car along a road near the sea. Along that road, there was warning signs that the road was not yet completed and no one should be on that road. But he continued along it at great speed. And tragically, he and his car went over the cliff and he died. 
Jesus in his words did not threaten his listeners. He warned them. Now there's a big difference in that, isn't there? A threat we often give to people we do not like. But we warn people we love. Jesus is warning us. He warns us that life on the broad road, which might seem harmless, doesn't hurt anyone, will hurt us. It actually will lead to destruction. A life full of pride, deep-rooted vengeful anger, greed, unforgiveness, a self-centered life and all the other things Jesus has been speaking about will destroy us and quite possibly others. Often it has been said that Jesus is always loving and it is a church which has created all these words about judgment or the need to make choices. But here it is Jesus saying it. He warns us about our choices. Again in those famous words in John 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In his own words Jesus warns there are choices and not all all choices are right. Jesus tells us that there's a narrow road which leads to life. There are two Greek words for life. One means the earthly biological life. The other, which is used here, is about life in the physical sense, but also about the supernatural life belonging to God and Christ, which the believers will receive in the future, but which they also enjoy here and now. It is a word used which our Bibles often translate eternal life. This eternal life is only made possible because Jesus died on the cross for us, so that we might know God. Jesus himself defined eternal life as this in John 17, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus in John 10 declares, I am the gate. And he goes on to say, whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. I have come that they may have a life and have it to the full. So life is about eternal life, salvation, but also life now as disciples, as we follow Christ. When Mother Teresa was interviewed, before she died. There were a number of questions put to her and the final question was, you've recently celebrated your 84th birthday. Are you at all afraid of dying? She replied, how can I be? Dying is going home to God. I have never been afraid. No, on the contrary, I look forward to it. Mother Teresa, when she was young, set out on that narrow road and the religious order she started grew to have houses throughout the world in over 137 countries. They helped give homes to children. They helped people with tuberculosis, the mentally ill, sick and the dying. She and her fellow sisters took the narrow road and it brought life to many in this world. And it was a road which led her and the others to eternal life. The few. Jesus says that there are two groups on the road. Many on the broad road, on the narrow road, there are a few. Now we could think, well, such a large crowd on the broad road, if everyone thinks it, it must be okay. But G.K. Chesterton, the writer, said, Right is right, even if nobody does it. Wrong is wrong, even if everybody is wrong about it. Jesus contrasts the many with the few on the narrow. But the few are not as few as the world would make us think. Today, if you imagine the world as a village of 100 people, 33 would claim to be Christians. In Europe, yes, Christianity is on retreat in many places. But for example, in China, it is growing incredibly. 
The Cultural Revolution in China from 1966 to 76 was a deadly attack on all religions in that land. Fifty years later, around 100 million Chinese have joined the church, the greatest turning to the Christian faith in history so far. Ron Boyd Macmillan of Open Doors shared in January this year that the reason the Chinese Communist Party under President Xi's leadership persecutes Christians is because they fear that the church will grow stronger in numbers. Macmillan says, We think the evidence as to why the Chinese church is so targeted is that the leaders are scared of the size of the church and the growth of the church. And if it grows at the rate that it has done since 1980, and that's about 7%, 8% a year, then you're looking at a group of people that will be 300 million strong nearly by 2030. And you know, the Christian, the Chinese leadership, they really do do long-term planning. I mean, their economic plan goes to 2049. So this bothers them. Because I think if the church continues to grow like that, then they'll have to share power. Yet we know here in Europe, we Christians are in the minority. We can feel alone. We may be the only Christian in our workplace, the only Christian among our family or living on our street. And that can be difficult. It can be hard to feel alone, especially with peer pressure. That is where the church community, life groups, worship, all become so important to encourage us, to build us up, to strengthen us, to comfort us as we walk that narrow road as one of the few. So fourthly, the life of adventure. Uh, G.K. Chesterton calls, called the Christian life the whirling adventure. Jesus shares two entrances. One entrance is wide, one entrance is small. How do I join the adventure? How do I get in? On the broad road, there's a, an easy access through a wide gate. On the other hand, the entrance to the narrow road is a narrow one. There is only one way in, and that is by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, to repent, believe, and follow him. We have to turn our back on everything we know to be wrong. That is all, not all that easy. The longer you've been on the wrong road, the harder it is to admit and to change, although it is never too late to do that. A. N. Wilson is an author and journalist in the United Kingdom, and he was known for many years for being anti-religious. But he wrote in a popular newspaper in 2009, For much of my life, I too have been one of those who did not believe. It was in my young manhood that I began to wonder how much of the Easter story I accepted, and in my thirties, I lost any religious belief whatsoever. I began to rail against Christianity and wrote a book entitled Jesus, which endeavoured to establish that he had been no more than a messianic prophet who had well and truly failed and died. Like most educated people in Britain and Northern Europe, I was born in 1950, I have grown up in a culture that is overwhelmingly secular and anti-religious. The universities, broadcasters, and media generally are not merely non-religious, they are positively anti. To my shame, it was this, I believe, that made me lose faith and heart in my youth. It felt so uncool to be religious. With the mentality of a child in the playground, I felt at some visceral level that being religious was unsexy, like having spots or wearing glasses. The vast majority of media pundits and intelligentsia in Britain are unbelievers, many of them quite fervent in their hatred of religion itself. For 10 or 15 of my middle years, I too was one of the mockers. But as time passed, I find myself going back to church. 
though at first only as a fellow traveller with the believers, not as one who shared the faith that Jesus had truly risen from the grave. But sometime over the past five or six years, I could not tell you exactly when, I found that I had changed. But there is more to it than that. My belief has come about in large measure because of the lives and examples of the people I have known. Not the famous, not saints, but friends and relations who have died and faced death in the light of the resurrection story or in the quiet acceptance that they have a future after they die. The Easter story answers their questions about the spiritual aspects of humanity. It changes people's lives. That too is why I now believe in it. Easter confronts us with a historical event set in time. The resurrection is the ultimate key to who we are. On the narrow road, Jesus says access is hard because the gate is small. We can only enter by faith in Jesus Christ. This is not about being doctrinally correct. It's about obedience. We know this is true for many people who may not know or understand the correct doctrines, yet they place their full trust in Jesus. We also know others who may be doctrinally correct and know everything, yet their hearts have never submitted to Christ as Lord and Saviour. Jesus is saying that everyone is on one of these two roads. We cannot have a foot on each road, he says. There is no middle road, no third gate, no neutral group. If we are on the broad road, there is nothing we need to do in order to stay on it. But if we want to get off it, we need to enter the narrow gate through repenting and putting our faith in Jesus Christ, then choosing to live as his disciple. We need his forgiveness and we need his spirit to help us. As we enter through the narrow gate, we find that although there may not be huge numbers on the road of life, we are not alone. We are part of a Christian family, a worldwide body represented in every country of the world. And most importantly, we find Jesus Christ himself goes along with us as we make the big decision to be his disciple. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness, said Joshua. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads to pray. Lord Jesus, as I stand or kneel or sit in this place, I fix my eyes again on you. And Lord, at this time I take my moments again to acknowledge the times I have lived on the broad road. I repent of my sins and ask your forgiveness. I choose to place all my trust, my belief in you, Lord Jesus, as the one who leads to life. I declare again to my soul that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And this day, I choose whom I will serve. I will serve you, Jesus, and I will follow you to the end of my days. Amen.
And let's now declare what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So I invite you to sit or to kneel or to bow your heads as Mark leads us in our intercessions. Let us pray. Almighty God, we dare approach you in boldness to receive mercy and find grace in our time of need, based on the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, seated at your right hand and interceding for us. We pray that we may be transformed into his image, that we may live Jesus-shaped lives, being a help to those whom you have placed on our path, and giving honor and glory to your holy name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, we pray that you will give grace to those whom you have called to serve in your house and to guide your people, to all bishops, priests and deacons, in particular to our own bishops Robert and David and our chaplain Grant. Provide them with every blessing they need to perform their duties and give that, under their guidance, your whole Church may serve you in unity and peace of heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we pray that you will protect those who are oppressed because of their faith in you. Provide them with all the blessings they need, in particular access to your written word and safe places to meet and worship together. Establish them in their faith and turn the hearts of their persecutors. We also pray for your people Israel, chosen by you above all the nations. Protect them in the land of their inheritance and hasten to fulfill all the good that you promised them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for the leaders in this world, that you will give them a right discernment and judgment to care for the vulnerable, do right where there is injustice, and be good stewards to your creation. We pray for Queen Elizabeth and King Willem Alexander and all ministers and officials under their authority. We pray for the formation of a new government here in the Netherlands. Will you guide the hearts of those involved towards a solution that you can use as a blessing for this country? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for the country of Afghanistan and the control of the Taliban. Will you bring an end to their reign of terror and protect those oppressed under their control? We pray for the people living on La Palma for protection during the ongoing volcanic eruptions. For the country of Haiti, for your blessing on the humanitarian aid and for all countries still suffering severely from the COVID pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for the congregation gathered here online. We thank you for all the blessings that we receive from you, that we can now gather physically and sing to your glory again, that we can meet up in live groups, prayer meetings and Bible studies again. And we pray for those that still suffer from effects of Corona, either due to the sickness itself or loss of work or loneliness, we ask for your care for all those among us that feel left out, those who are addicted or depressed or in any other trouble. And we pray for your support and healing love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we remember before you all your servants that have departed this life in your faith and in the hope of the resurrection. 
we ask you to give us grace that, rejoicing in their fellowship, we may follow their good example, and with them be partakers of your heavenly kingdom. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we come to our closing prayers. Faithful God, receive all our monies, our time, our gifts, our lives. We offer you this day. May we so live the life of Christ that your church may be a sign of salvation to all the nations of the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. O gracious and holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, intelligence to understand you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to see you, a heart to meditate on you, and a life to proclaim you. Through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we come now to our church life notices. Uh, first of all, this coming Saturday, 16th of October, all Saints will be holding a half-day holiday club for our, ch our kids uh, aged between 4 and 12 years old. This will be held at Cosmic, our regular home. It begins at 10.30, ends at 4. If you're interested in booking in your children, please contact Sarah Van Oort or if you have any other questions. So Holiday Club this coming Saturday 16th. Uh, secondly, about the restrictions. Uh, we're exploring as a church how we can respond to the relaxation of corona restrictions within the Netherlands. Now, a short questionnaire has been sent out to all All Saints members via email or WhatsApp and asks three questions that we want to ask your response for. First of all, after no longer having to distance within our Sunday worship, shall we respond, return to no distancing? Secondly, about beginning again to offer wine during communion. And the third question is about offering coffee or tea after our Sunday services. It's important that you do please give us your, your view, even if you'll go with whatever. <laughs> please do let us know. If you have not completed the survey yet, please do so by the end of today or the latest to start of tomorrow, Monday. We have a council meeting this coming Tuesday evening and we will collate the figures on Monday evening onwards and make our decision on Tuesday. Thirdly, uh, church barbecue. It's important to give opportunities to be together socially again as a church community. So on Sunday the 31st of October, after the service, we're going to hold our autumn barbecue. If you can't make the service, please do come along and join us uh, for the food. So let's sing together now our closing hymn of praise. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still. Waters, his goodness restores my soul, and I will trust in you alone, and I will trust in you.
Jesus' mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me home. He guides my ways in righteousness, and He anoints my head. We receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly upon you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you today and always. Amen. Let's pray together our closing prayer. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.